You're listening to the micro version of the Savage Lovecast, www.savagelovecast.com. If you're stuck in a relationship quandary, or if you're looking for sexual Okay, the Texas state legislature in April of this year, let's pause there. Because you know this isn't going to be good, right? In the long history of sentences, no sentence that's ever started with the Texas state legislature ever ended well. The Texas state legislature legalized weed today. The Texas state legislature sued the Trump administration to block the construction of the border. The Texas state legislature gave you an awesome blowjob. No, that's never how it goes. When someone says the Texas state legislature, we all know to brace ourselves for whatever bad news is coming next. Anyway, in April of this year, the Texas state legislature did not give you an awesome blowjob. The Texas state legislature cut millions of dollars from clean air and water programs and redirected those funds to the state's quote unquote crisis pregnancy centers. They want every pregnancy carried to term in Texas, which is why they're directing state funds to CPCs or crisis pregnancy centers, but they want every child born in Texas to breathe dirty air and drink dirty water because they care only about fetal life. Anyway, in 2006, according to NARAL, Texas was spending $5 million per year on crisis pregnancy centers. Today, Texas is spending $20 million a year on them. Now, if you don't know what a crisis pregnancy center is, Caitlin Bancroft's piece at Huffington Post, What I Learned Undercover at a Crisis Pregnancy Center, is a good primer, or is it primer? Anyway, quoting from Bancroft's piece, CPCs use a variety of tactics to lure women into their buildings. They offer free pregnancy testing, are known to list themselves under abortion in online directories and search results, and may use misleading names with the hope that women will confuse them for legitimate healthcare providers. Once inside, women are treated to a carefully crafted program of manipulation designed to dissuade them from choosing abortion, birth control, and if they're not married, sex. CPCs are often disguised as medical facilities, the Texas Observer reports. Investigations have found that CPCs provide scientifically inaccurate information to pregnant women, the Texas Observer reports, including claims that having an abortion would increase risk of breast cancer, infertility, and psychological trauma, statements that have been debunked by the Texas Medical Association. All right, so once a woman enters a CPC, a woman who has been led to believe she will be able to access a full range of reproductive health care options, including abortion, the lies and the slut-shaming and the Jesus-freaking begin. Bancroft, she pretended to be pregnant when she visited CPCs in Virginia, and she was told that abortion would scar her for life, that condoms are porous and don't protect women from pregnancy or sexually transmitted infections, and that IUDs kill women. All lies Lies that came packed in 50 shades of slut shaming. She was asked about her number of sex partners and what her parents would think if they knew she was having sex before marriage and thinking about abortion. Now, Texas, which defunded Planned Parenthood in 2011 and saw their sexually transmitted infection rates and rates of unplanned pregnancies skyrocket. And for the slow out there, unplanned pregnancies are the pregnancies likeliest to result in abortion? Texas also saw their maternal death rates go through the roof after they defunded Planned Parenthood in 2011. Texas has more CPCs than legitimate family planning and women's health clinics. But hey, blue state people, blue state people like me, let's not get smug. I live in one of the bluest of the blue states, Washington, Dem governor to Dem U.S. senators. We got gay marriage before you did, along with light rail and legal weed. And we've got almost as many crisis pregnancy centers here as legit women's health clinics. Now, most people aren't aware of the existence of CPCs. That's They count on that. CPCs count on most people, including most women, not being aware of their existence. They fly under the radar even as they rake in state funding. And the damage they do is incredible. Telling scared, uninformed, often poor women, CPCs prey on the poor, particularly Telling these women they shouldn't bother using condoms or that IUDs are dangerous and pushing these women to have more children than they can possibly care for. Remember, folks, most women who are seeking abortions already have one or more children at home. This harms women. It can actually kill women. Women who see women's health care provider on the side of a building, women who Google abortion and the first returns are for CPCs, wind up being abused and lied to and put at risk by people who are dressing up like doctors but aren't and work in places that look like medical clinics, 
but aren't. To raise awareness of CPCs, the harm they do, the lies they tell, the public funds that are wasted on them, groups working to protect women's health care, groups working to protect women, period, are staging a week of action to expose CPCs. A large coalition calling itself the Reproductive Rights Resistance Squad, Lady Parts Justice, NARAL, Pro-Choice America, Shout Your Abortion, and more. They're staging protests online and off all across the country this week. The week of action started yesterday, July 17th, and goes through July 26th. Go to exposefakeclinics.com or search the hashtag exposefakeclinics on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram to find out what's going on in your community and what you can do to expose these fake and very dangerous clinics and expose the lying liars behind them and the lying politicians who fund them. There are more than 4,000 CPCs all across the United States compared to just 780 abortion care providers, according to Narrow. And like I said, CPCs aren't just a problem in red states. They're in blue states, too. So wherever you are, join this resistance. ExposeFakeClinics.com. All right, coming up on today's show, lots of your cue, bunches of my A. Amanda Marcotte from Salon, where she writes about politics and feminism, joins us to talk about Game of Thrones. And on the Magnum edition of the Savage Lovecast, which you can subscribe to at SavageLovecast.com. Dot com, which is longer and no ads, we've got a doctor in to take a deep dive, a deep root around in vaginal fisting. That's on the Magnum. And a quick programming note about an upcoming show. Cecile Richards, head of Planned Parenthood, is going to join us to talk about Planned Parenthood. And then we're going to talk with a physician from Planned Parenthood and field a bunch of your health-related questions. So if you have a health question that you want one of Planned Parenthood's top docs to tackle for you, give us a call, 206-302-2064, and record it for us, and we may answer it on the Planned Parenthood show. All right, here we go. Today's show is starting now. This episode of the Savage Love Cast is brought to you by Thrive Market, the new convenient way to get the highest quality natural organic groceries delivered to your door. Try it for free for 30 days and get an extra 20% off at thrivemarket.com slash savage. Today's episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron delivers all fresh, high-quality ingredients and recipes you need to create delicious home-cooked meals. Get your first three meals for free by going to blueapron.com slash savage. This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Casper, the online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the cost. Save 50 bucks toward a mattress purchase by going to casper.com slash savage love and entering the promo code savage love. Hi, Dan. Um, I am a 20-something lesbian in the Midwest, and my girlfriend and I are exploring more like dom sub things. And she wants me to tell her to shut up. And I'm having a hard time because we live in a small apartment complex and I get self-conscious. And so sometimes I feel like me telling her to shut up will come off as like naggy or I don't know, whenever I'm in the moment and I think of it, I'm just like, oh, this is just not going to sound right. So I guess how do you get more comfortable with certain kinds of dirty talk like that? You don't have to scream shut up at your girlfriend. You can take her by the shoulders and you can say in a quiet and menacing and sexy theory tone, honey, darling, shut up. And it'll be just as effective. I promise you. It'll be better. It's sexier than screaming. You don't want to have a dom sub dynamic where you're yelling at each other. You want to be powerful and powerful person, as the saying goes, doesn't have to raise their voice. They force other people to listen. So. Go for quiet and menacing over screaming and yelling. And you can have your dom sub dynamic and the thin walls in your apartment too. Hey, Dan. I'm calling about an issue that's sort of been plaguing me since I was a teenager and it's insecurity about penis size. I am average, 100% average. And I've never heard anybody complain. I had one friend in high school who pointed out that it was small. I had uh, one lover who said that her ex-husband had been better endowed, but all of those things happened like 20 plus years ago, and I still can't get out from under it. All of my subsequent and current partners have not had any issue at all. One said it was nice size, one said that it was girthy, 
But when anybody brings it up, when anybody even mentions, oh, look at that individual or look at that picture or look at that video, it gets me. And I'm just wondering if there's some way for me to get out from under that. It's a lot of conditioning and it's a lot of, I guess, just self-torture. So basically, nothing but compliments, girthy, fine, love your dick. For all of your adult life, somebody 20 years ago said something disparaging about your dick, said it was small, and you can't get over that? Dude, get the fuck over it already. Dick is great. Big dicks are great. Dicks can be too big. We had the author of Everybody Lies, Seth Stevens Davidowitz, on the show a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things that he, one of the big data things that he unpacks in, in his book is that a lot of searches around dick that women do is that what do you do when the dick's too big? So, like a giant penis isn't necessarily your friend. A giant penis can be a curse and a burden. An average-sized dick works for everybody. And the person the dick is attached to is at least as important, if not more important, in most cases than just the dick all by itself. There are places you can go to have dick all by itself. There are places... There are truck stomps. There are sex clubs with holes in the wall where people pop their dick through and all they are is the dick. You don't go to those places. Most people don't go to those places. I don't go to those places. But those places exist where it's just the dick. But you're not just the dick. You're the dick and the person and the brain and the hands and the butt and the tits and the pits and the feet and the legs and the thoughts and the feelings and the impulses and the jokes and the sense of humor that that dick is attached to. You don't just bring that dick alone to a romantic relationship or a sexual encounter or a blowjob or PIV or whatever. You bring all of that. And you know what? A shitty personality shaves inches off a dick. An asshole, an inconsiderate, rude, selfish jerk shaves inches off a dick. A good, decent, great guy with an average dick who's good at oral and giving and considerate but also takes pleasure with their partner, it adds inches to the dick. No one is going to, after having great sex with somebody with an average dick, think, ah, oh, it would have been better with a couple more inches. They're going to think, that was great sex. And great sex just isn't dick slamming in and out of something. Great sex is a lot more. And an average dick does just fine for most people. There are lots of women out there who would rather suck an average dick than some massive prick. There are a lot of women out there who an average dick is a more comfortable fit for PIV and an average dick is less intimidating if you're doing butt stuff. Revel in your average dick. Embrace your average It's the only dick you're ever going to have. So still obsessing about this one comment one person made a million years ago it's a waste of time and emotional energy. I, I understand. I totally get it. One person says something rude about me on Twitter. It's all I see. There can be a hundred compliments for me on Twitter. And those don't matter because one person said something shitty. I understand. I have my own issues around one comment haunting me while all the other compliments are disregarded. But you've got to get over this. Your dick has gotten nothing but good reviews from the people you fucked over the last couple of decades. Stop obsessing. Yes, there are bigger dicks up there. Sometimes I think it would be really great if straight guys could just decide to be gay for a year or two and see dicks in all their different shapes and sizes. Have a lot of gay sex. If that was really how being gay worked, they could just choose it for a while. Because I think it would make straight guys more comfortable with their dicks if they saw all the different dicks out there. And they saw that some big dicks are attached to lousy lovers and some little dicks are attached to great lovers. And it's not just about the dick. It's about everything else. You got everything else going on. Stop obsessing about the dick you've got and keep enjoying it. Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. And I'm not just a spokesmodel. I am a client. They make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone. And joining us today, because he happened to be in the building, is the person who does the incredible home cooking with Blue Apron. Hey, honey. Hi. How's it going? Good. This is my husband. And I wanted, since you were here, we dragged you on because Blue Apron sends us the food and I keep talking about how it makes home cooking available to everyone. You do the Blue Apron cooking. I do the Blue Apron dishes. Yeah, I do the Blue Apron cooking. And you were a great cook and always have been. Yeah. But, but this you've is taken like, to Blue Apron. You <laughs> yeah, love Blue Apron. It's absolutely convenient. I, the, the thing I, I, I totally enjoy cooking, the thing I hate is going to the store. 
I hate shopping in the grocery store. Why? Um, it's just because you see the same people every day and then you have to start conversations, you know, human like, interaction. I know, I know. I'm really shy and I'm like usually not into like talking. Has anyone who's ever visited your Instagram yeah, account? I know, knows I know, I know. You are super duper shy. However, grocery stores where you have to be fully clothed. Yeah. I, yeah. So it's great. You get a box, all the ingredients are there. Everything is recyclable, including the box. In fact, we use the box as a recycling container <laughs> when it comes. <laughs> Um, but the food, let's not talk about the cardboard. Let's talk about the food. The food yeah. is excellent. Yeah, the food's always good. In fact, we yeah, we often keep the recipes and hold them aside and we sometimes them recreate yeah. them, which requires you going to the store fully clothed yeah, and having human true. interactions with people you see on the regular. And we save money eating Blue Apron. We do. If you go to the store, you're bound to spend more money on crap you don't need than the actual Things food you might you not do end up need. eating. Exactly. Because everything for Blue Apron comes perfectly proportioned. You get only the exact amount of X that you need to make this dish. Yes. So there's no waste. Yes, exactly. Less than $10 per person per meal. Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with pre proportioned ingredients, like we were just saying, that make it possible for you or your husband to make delicious home cooked meals. And you get to choose from a variety of recipes each week. Do you do that? Do you make the choices? I do. I do. It, you I'm get online? so lazy. Yeah, they have like options. They have a 30 minutes or less kind of option and then which is like super easy and cooks up really fast. And then they have one that's like minimal prep, which is like cuz usually there's a lot of chopping involved in mm-hmm. blue apron meals, a lot of like chopping and little little kind of steps. And the minimal prep one is like cut something in half and put it in a frying pan. And it's perfect. Recipes also aren't repeated within a year, so you will never get bored. You can customize your recipes each week based on your preferences or Terry's. And Blue Apron has several delivery options so you can choose what fits your needs. And there is no weekly commitments. You only get what you want coming up. Items coming up. Are we going to get these, honey? Ribeye steak with spicy vegetable hash with marinated cucumber. Did we sign up for that? A spicy vegetable has sounds like a lot of chopping, so probably not. <laughs> We're probably getting something equally delicious, but with less prep. And also purple rice miso spinach bowls with black garlic and pepper tempura. I know we're getting that. We're getting that? Yeah. Because that sounds amazing. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals for free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash savage. You will love how good it feels and tastes to create or have created for you incredible home cooked meals with Blue Apron. So do not wait. That's blueapron.com slash savage. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Hey Dan, I'm a pansexual man hoping to start a business working as a pro dom. I'm very much open about my sexuality with pretty much everyone and I kind of like it that way. I'm very classically masculine in both mannerisms and physique. I understand that's a big part of the job. People say I'm very straight acting, which makes me sick in my mouth a little bit, but you get the idea. Now, here's the thing. I've been told by a fellow mandom that it's best to market myself as straight, even though majority of paying clients are going to be men. So my two questions are, one, is this facilitating something of the unpleasant attitudes that exist in the gay community? Can I offset that? Is there anything I can do? And secondly, we all know that you personally are not put off by gayness in a man. But more importantly, do you really think I'll attract more customers? if I pretend to be straight or do you think it's going to put more people off? I don't think there's any studies. I don't think anyone's marketed doms as straight and marketed doms as gay male doms for male clients and had a control group where they were marketed as whatever or nothing to see who gets more calls, who gets more bookings, who gets more clients. There's no definitive ruling that I can give you here, but you have at least one sample. You have your friend, it's a data point. I guess it's not a study who is a pro dom who tells you that you should market yourself as straight because that brings all the gay dogs to the yard. And maybe that's true. And maybe he would know better than I. And I don't think you have to feel guilty about that. You know, a, a pro dom creates a persona and that's the persona that people want to interact with. It is a performance. And really, you know, for women I know who are pro doms and even for some guys I've known who are pro doms, it becomes like your drag character. It has a different name. It wears a different kind of style of clothing. I know pro doms who talk about their pro dom persona as a separate person, the way some drag queens will talk about their drag persona as a a different and separate person from themselves. When I'm 
of Helvetica bold, I do this and this and this. But when I'm me, I would never do that. And I hear the same kind of lingo and rhetoric and bifurcation when my Dom friends talk about their Dom personas and that role, that there's this person I become and there's the person I am and there's maybe some overlap, but there's a real gulp, there's a real difference. So the fact that you're pansexual in real life, but traditionally masculine in appearance and demeanor, I see no problem with your Dom persona being a straight guy, especially because you're going into this to make money and to make people happy to help them fulfill their fantasies. And yeah, there are a lot of guys out there who are turned on by the thought of being dominated or tied up or tortured by a straight guy because part of what turns them on, maybe that perceived tiny residual dollop of contempt because that might be part of it for those guys, part of what turns them on. Also, marketing yourself as a straight guy to other men gets you off the having sex with them hook. If you are a pro-dom, and in a lot of places, pro-domination work is legal because there's no sex, the guys booking you will know that sex isn't something that they can wheedle out of you or ask for because you're straight and it's not going to be sex. It's going to be BDSM play and no physical contact, no sex. You're never going to fuck them. You're never going to let them suck your dick. You're never going to suck bears. That's not going to happen. That's not on the table. All the BDSM stuff is on the table. And that would, you marketing yourself as straight, weed out of your client pile, your pool of potential clients, any guy who's looking for sex from the pro dom he hires and not just BDSM play. I guess I've talked all around your question. I haven't really answered it. Does marketing yourself as straight to submissive gay guys who might want to hire a pro dom reinforce unpleasant attitudes? Maybe, maybe in some cases it might. It depends on the sub who's booking you. If he's healthy and articulate and enjoys BDSM play and compartmentalizes this, I don't think he's going to be damaged by worshiping or serving a straight guy in this erotic context. It's a scene. It's play. It's fantasy. People who engage in BDSM play tend to be healthier and more well-adjusted than the average person who doesn't engage in BDSM play. It's not that BDSM play is magic. It's that people who thoughtfully are able to accept their desires and incorporate them into their life tend to be healthier and happier. It's not like just people with BDSM desires. These studies are people who actively engage in BDSM play and are part of their local BDSM communities. They tend to be happier and healthier. Hopefully those are the guys you will scoop up. And some gay guys are just into straight guys. And gay guys who are into BDSM, gay guys who are submissive, it may feel more demeaning, more degrading, and therefore more of a turn-on to serve you than to serve some guy who is, like them, g g g gay This episode of the Savage Lovecast is brought to you by Casper, the online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the cost. Casper is revolutionizing the mattress industry by cutting the cost of dealing with resellers and showrooms and passing all those savings directly on to you. Casper mattresses are obsessively engineered mattresses at a very fair price made with supportive memory foam for a sleep surface with just the right sink and just the right bounce and perfect for your back. Isn't that right, honey? Uh, totally perfect for my back. Yes. Terry is still here. Terry is sitting in today on the ads. Uh, yeah, I, we were recently at a hotel for a few days and I, you know me, like I have, I have constant back problems and, uh, I was in so much pain after three days at that hotel. The soft, squishy mattress. It was a soft, squishy mattress. I didn't like the pillows. And we, I could not First world wait. problems. Hashtag. I know, hashtag I know, I know. <laughs> oh, sweet. Just, yeah. No, um, I was having so many problems. I, mean, I could not wait to get home. And the first night back, I woke up the next morning absolutely refreshed from a night in our bed. We love our Casper yeah, mattress. I love our cat- Casper mattress. What? I would take another in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> hint, hint, Casper. No, just kidding. <laughs> Keep whoring it up. Maybe they'll send us a mattress. Woo-woo. Maybe I'll take some pictures on a Casper mattress for Instagram. I think you have a few Instagram <laughs> pictures on your Casper mattress. Mm. There's no surface in our house that's safe or yeah. sacred. So in addition to being good for your back, it also has a breathable design that helps you sleep cool. And that's how I like to sleep. A cool and breathable design helps you regulate your temperature throughout the night. And Casper's mattresses, like my husband Terry, are made right here in the USA. Terry and I sleep on that Casper mattress every goddamn night, except when we're hotels and Terry's back is aching, and you should too. 
You can buy a Casper mattress easily online and completely risk-free. Casper offers a free delivery in the U.S. and Canada and painless returns. And you know what? You're not going to want to return this mattress. It's too good. But painless returns within a 100-day period so you don't have to lie down in a showroom. And you can save an additional 50 bucks toward a mattress purchase by going to casper.com slash savagelove and entering the promo code savagelove. That's casper.com slash savagelove and promo code savagelove. Terms and conditions apply. Hey, Dan. Late 20-something living in Chicago. I love having sex on my period. If I'm with a guy and he seems grossed out by this, it's a huge turnoff. Can I judge a guy for refusing to fuck me while I'm bleeding? Or am I being too judgy? You can kick a man to the curb for not fucking you when you're bleeding, for not fucking you during your period. If getting fucked during your period is something that you enjoy, if it's a requirement for the man you want to have a relationship with, the sooner you show guys who have a problem with the door, the sooner you're going to land on a guy who loves period sex just as much as you do. So you have my blessing to uh, reject anyone who doesn't want what you want, whatever it is. Hi, Dan. I have a question for you. I have explained to my uh, girlfriend, my domestic partner, that I'm unable to live a uh, monogamous, strictly monogamous life. I'm happy to do, and I think what fits me best is a monogamish. Uh, So we've come to an agreement where, okay, when I'm traveling out of town, I can hire a sex worker. I want to be equitable in our relationship. She's not interested in sexually being with anybody else. And so we're wondering what's a way that uh, we could make it equitable. I don't see how this isn't already equitable. You're getting what you want and your girlfriend is getting what she wants. You're doing what you would like to do and she's doing what she would like to do. You would like to have sex with other women at times and you get to and she would not like to have sex with other men and she doesn't have to to create some sort of false equity here. Unless your girlfriend has only consented to this arrangement under duress, unless your girlfriend is extremely upset by the fact that you are sometimes sleeping with escorts when you're out of town, there's no equity issue here. There's nothing really to worry about. You would like to have sex with other women. You have been granted an accommodation that allows you to have sex with other women in a way that presumably leaves your girlfriend feeling not all that insecure. Hiring a professional when you're out of town, that professional is not going to want to run off with you. They're they're not going to catch feelings for you and that therefore won't be a risk to the relationship. And because it only happens when you're out of town, it's not going to scandalize the neighbors, coworkers, mutual friends. So your girlfriend won't be humiliated. You guys have created a an arrangement that allows you to be socially monogamous, perceived to be monogamous, even though technically you're kind of not. So the equity you should be aiming for here isn't equity around she gets to sleep with other people too, if that's not something that she would like to do. I think the equity you should be looking at, the, the, the thing that is the, the key here is the accommodation that has been made. She has made an accommodation for you that allows you to be who you are sexually and to feel sexually fulfilled and have what you want in your life erotically. And you should tell her that if there is ever a circumstance or a time or an issue or a kink or anything where an accommodation will be required of you, you will be willing and able uh, and anxious to make that accommodation for her in whatever form it ultimately takes. Some women's kinks only seem to surface later in life. Hence all those middle-aged women 10 years ago who are reading Fifty Shades of Grey and suddenly realizing they wanted to experiment with BDSM. It could be that your girlfriend five years from now discovers that she would like to try X. Let's say pegging. She would like to strap on a dildo and fuck some dude in the ass. You can accommodate that yourself if you are up for being fucked in the ass. If you are not up for being fucked in the ass, you can accommodate that new interest of hers by saying, Get on Craigslist. Get on FetLife. We can get on together. Let's find a guy who is into that and would be up for being pegged by you. And then you can equitably make the accommodation that allows her to be who she is sexually and to be fulfilled sexually in the same way she made an accommodation earlier on in the relationship that allowed you to be who you are and feel fulfilled sexually. So don't stress about this right now, that what seems inequitable. 
you are having the kind of sex that you would like to have, which includes sex with the girlfriend, sex with other women when you're out of town, escorts. She is having the kind of sex she would like to have, which is just sex with you at this time. Someday, and that day may never come, she may call upon you to make an accommodation for her. But until that day, accept the accommodation that she has made for you graciously and without too much hand-wringing. Eating healthy can be hard because it takes time and it's expensive. And that's where ThriveMarket.com comes in. Thrive Market can change the way you eat and shop. It's a convenient new way to get the highest quality natural organic groceries like healthy snacks, supplements, and foods to stock up your pantry at 20 to 50% less than even the discount stores. Thrive Market is like Costco meets Whole Foods online. Pay just 60 bucks a year and get wholesale pricing all year long. The average Thrive Market customer saves about 40 bucks per order, and Thrive guarantees you'll save more than your membership fee within your first two orders. In fact, they'll let you test drive the savings for free before you have to buy your membership. Now, this is a sex advice show, and you might remember the last time we talked about Thrive Market, we mentioned that they offer coconut oil, right? Well, Thrive Market also has a section of intimate products. So if Mayan chocolate-flavored lube is your cup of tea, then you're going to want to check this out. They also offer a variety of condoms along with a ton of health and beauty products. Discover for yourself why 400,000 members believe in Thrive Market. For every paid Thrive Market membership, a free membership is donated to a family in need in the United States. That is for real. We checked. Test drive it again for free for 30 days and get an extra 20% off at thrivemarket.com slash savage. That's an extra 20% off at thrivemarket.com slash savage. Hi, Dan. 29-year-old straight female calling from Florida. I just started seeing a guy and we've been having sex for two months. The sex is pretty great except he won't go down on me. He's a great catch in so many ways. He's intelligent, kind, genuine, but I'm afraid I won't stay interested in the long term if he can't do oral. This has never been a problem with past partners. What kind of things could be keeping him from going down on me? Do I just not enjoy it? And is it worth keeping around an all-around amazing guy, even though I might be sexually dissatisfied in the future? I have no idea what might be preventing him from going down on you. You know who knows what might be preventing him from going down on you? He does. It's been two months. If oral is something that you require, if the absence of oral is a deal breaker for you. If going without oral is a, a price of admission, you are unwilling to pay to be with someone, however lovely they might be in every other respect. Tell him that. Just fucking lay it on the table. Look, I really like you. You are a great guy. I have to have a boyfriend or part, long-term partner. It's fun right now. I'm willing to like hang out for a few more weeks. But if we're looking at something long-term and – that may seem like a conversation that at two months is premature, but I think you should fucking go for it. If we're thinking about anything long term, if this is something more than a summer fling, you're going to have to eat my pussy. And you're going to have to eat my pussy like you like eating pussy. So I'd like to hear what the problem is. I'd like to hear why you don't eat pussy. Out with it and see what he says. Maybe he just thinks he's bad at it and feels insecure. Maybe he has issues with women's bodies, in which case runs screaming. Maybe he had some traumatic experience with oral sex once upon a time and he needs somebody to take him by the hand and walk him back into that garden. I don't know what his issue is. Only you have the power to find out what his issue is because you have him. Ask him. Use your words and tell him the truth. Tell him that this is potentially a deal breaker for you. You require oral. And if oral ain't happening... It's been a nice two months. Maybe we can enjoy another month or so this summer. But then it's over if the world doesn't happen. Hey, Dan. Uh, calling from a uh, big East Coast city about a friend of mine, a uh, 30-year-old straight male who just moved to a southern state with his girlfriend. who hasn't been dating very long. This guy used to be a boozer, smoker, partier, junk food eater. It's all around bro guy. And ever since he's moved in with this girl, he has totally done a 180. He is getting his NDA. He no longer smokes weed. Um, he barely drinks. He's like eating like broccoli and salmon every night, which is fine, whatever. But the thing that bugs me the most is uh, <clears throat> she's no longer allowing him to watch anything 
with violence against women, which I understand on the surface sounds like a great idea, but this guy is a history buff, loves stuff like Game of Thrones, stuff set in like history type settings, uh, historical fiction things. And, you know, a lot of that stuff includes violence against women, which I, you know, don't condone, but at the same time, it's like one of the most popular shows in the world. And I feel really bad for this guy that he's now no longer allowed to watch his entirely favorite show. Maybe he is watching Secret. I don't know. I'm trying to get some feedback. Is this a bad thing that she's doing? Or should everybody else who is against violence against women and uh, who considers themselves somewhat of a feminist, uh, should we get down with this? Should we boycott things like Game of Thrones? Or is uh, this woman cutting my man's manhood off uh, by not allowing him to watch just TV shows that he likes? Joining me by phone to help tackle this question, Amanda Marcotte, a journalist for Salon.com, also a feminist and a kick-ass presence on Twitter, and you should be following her. Hey, Amanda. Hey, thanks for having me. So you came on the show uh, earlier in the year, and together we talked about how problematic uh, Beauty and the Beast was, the live-action film and the myth and the story. And single-handedly, or dual-handedly, you and I together, helped ensure that that was a worldwide bomb, that they barely made a cent, didn't recoup their investment. We drove Beauty and the Beast out of the theaters. Now let's set our sights on Game of Thrones. So should feminists boycott Game of Thrones? No. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I, I would be the biggest hypocrite in the world. I, I'm standing in my living room looking at a wall I have of, of paintings of Game of Thrones. I, I love it. <laughs> but there are a lot of feminists who argue that, you know, the way it shows sexual violence, you know, this guy is saying, but that's history. Well, Game of Thrones is not history. The Seven Kingdoms don't exist. Westeros is a made up place. These are not actual continents, not actual kingdoms. And so, you know, this deployment of, you know, the use of uh, sexual violence in the show and, and the sexual objectification of women uh, for our entertainment, some feminists have argued, is deeply problematic. You know, it, it, it's an interesting show. I mean, I, I think that there are scenes on the show that really do cross the line. I mean, especially in the early seasons when it was clear that they had like a a mandatory breast per per episode, naked breast per episode um, minimum to make the produ the executive producers happy mm -hmm. at HBO. Um, that was just plain objectification. But as far as the sexual violence, there's a couple of times on the show where I think they portrayed it irresponsibly. But on the whole, I, I, I do argue with the notion that portraying equals endorsing. Mm -hmm. I mean, by and large, the show does try to portray violence against women as, as part of a larger narrative about, you know, the evils of war. I was just actually I was momentarily distracted because I was thinking about, you know, all the grief they've gotten over the years of producers about, you know, the mandatory breast per episode and naked women. And we've seen uh, vulvas on the show or pubic mounds on the show. And last season, they, I think, very self-consciously brandished an uncircumcised penis. And they were like, all right, there you go. There's a dick, everybody. Like it was centered in the shot for of a gratuitous three or four seconds. Did you see that episode with the theatrical troupe? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I laughed pretty hard when they did that. It, it couldn't have been more obvious that they were sort of trolling the audience with that. So let's talk about uh, this guy's friend's relationship. So his friend, who is a big uh, boozer and pothead and ate a lot of junk food, met a new girl, and he, he's given up the weed, he's given up the booze, he's eating broccoli uh, and salmon and getting his MBA or whatever it was. Uh, so she's obviously had, I guess, a positive impact on him this guy, but she no longer allows him to watch Game of Thrones, formerly his favorite show like it is your favorite show. Is that a reasonable thing for a feminist girlfriend to ask her boyfriend to do? No, absolutely not. I mean, I flinched at the word allow, Well, and he uses it multiple times, and I don't know if that's actually what's going on in his friend's relationship or if that's just how he perceives it, mm -hmm. but if you're in a position where the words allow are kind of coming into what's supposed to be a relationship between adults, I feel that there's already a problem in your relationship. <laughs> So, you know, if, if you were dating somebody who watched violent pornography, if you were dating somebody who watched Game of Thrones for the wrong reasons because they were looking forward to, say, the rape of Sansa episode, 
um, would you break up with them? I mean, somebody who watches that kind of entertainment for the sexist or misogynistic violence, you know, that you're not going to cure them of that impulse. They're not going to become better men because you don't allow them to watch this thing. If they're watching it for the wrong reasons, they can stop watching it, but they still might want to watch it for the wrong reasons. The wrong reason, the, the, the bedrock wrong reason is still there, even if they stop consuming the media. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. Like I, you would, I, I would hope that you know somebody well enough to, or know, understand these things well enough to know the difference between somebody who's watching it for the right reasons and somebody who is, yeah, like you said, just getting off on, I, I can't, yeah, I, I struggle to wrap my mind around getting off on the rape of Sansa on the show. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but if for some reason that you just liked watching that poor girl get raped, well, yeah, I, I think I would, I would just break up with that person instead of get into this weird power struggle. But it doesn't sound like his friend liked the show for that reason. It sounds like his friend likes the show for the same reason most of us like the show, which is it's a, a good, entertaining show and in, in no way endorses rape or sexual violence. There's so much media. You know, I've had a problem. This is a you know, this is an ancient reference, but Silence of the Lambs. I left halfway through the movie because I just couldn't take. Like, oh, women being tortured as entertainment is like the heart of this this film. And a lot of people really loved that movie. And there's so much entertainment and media out there that is, you know, woman in peril or woman in danger or Law and Order SVU over and over and over again. And so much of our entertainment is the stylized abuse of or or or, or rape of of women and women's bodies. How, how do you differentiate? But how, how do you decide which is entertaining and which is problematic and isn't just the glut of it itself evidence of a problem you know i think sometimes yes i i feel like it's it's a very gray and ambiguous zone for me because i think you know there is no doubt that because of the sort of gender narratives that already exist in our culture we kind of get off um a little un, in certain unsavory ways on that on the other hand I mean, I, 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 this is a, it is a very legitimately tough situation mm-hmm. because I, I think any individual product who can point to it and say, well, for me, that's over the line or it's not, but it, it's very, you very rarely are actually going to get media that is endorsing violence against women. It may be exploiting it. And I think sometimes Game of Thrones has crossed the line, but I, I don't think that, you know, it's it's certainly not as cut and dry as saying, say, for instance, Beauty and the Beast is a sexist narrative. <laughs> it's a little bit more complicated than that. And I think, you know, we should let people have the space to feel complications about this and, and have complicated emotions. And, and honestly, what is art? and narrative and fiction if it's not trying to sort of instill, ask more, have us ask more questions instead of give us pat answers. What would you say if you got on the phone with this guy's girlfriend, the girlfriend who is shoving broccoli and salmon down this guy's throat and not allowing him to watch Game of Thrones? If, if she mentioned that to you in a bar, if she was a new acquaintance or you know, a coworker and she said, well, I don't allow my boyfriend to watch Game of Thrones. Besides you know, coming out to her as a Game of Thrones fan yourself, what would you say to her? I mean, I would try to usually just walk out away from somebody who says things like that. I don't allow my <laughs> boyfriend to do. Just back away slowly. Like that's that's toxic on a level I can't even deal with. But if I was, if I felt like under fire to have to say something to her, I would say, why not? You know, talk to him about what he likes about the show. You know, actually interrogate this instead of just have this black and white opinion about what it is and what it means. He, he may surprise you. He may actually be getting something out of it that is actually kind of interesting and profound that you haven't thought about. Amanda Marcotte, journalist for Salon.com. Terrific presence on Twitter. Follow her at Amanda Marcotte on Twitter. Thanks, Amanda, for coming on the show again. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, Dan. Um, I've known this guy for about 10 years and we hooked up on and off and about six months ago, um, it got a bit more serious. I mean, you know, we started dating each other actually and fell in love and it's been, it was really wonderful. Um, I discovered last week that 
he had lied to me about going to college and getting his master's degree and, you know, over the course of our relationship had like mentioned what his thesis was and, you know, going to labs. And so I ended up breaking up with him um, just because I was concerned about the ease with which he lied to me. And, you know, I, I was really worried about what else he lied to me about. I had unprotected sex with this person. So my question is, um, I've had a lot of trouble letting go and I relapsed and saw him and slept with him last night. And I'm just really trying to figure out how to move on. And he's been very apologetic. Finally, when I initially confronted him, he said the reason that um, he, you know, the reason that I couldn't find his master's stuff was because he was doing top secret work for the government. But finally, he's kind of admitted to lying um, and apologized and seems really, really sorry um, and has assured me that he hasn't lied to me about anything else and that he wants me in his life. Um, And I just have this sneaking suspicion that there's a lot of other stuff he lied to me about, like little things, big things. And so I'm just wondering, like, how do I move on? Like, should I block him? You know, um, what do I do? (laughs) If you need to block him, unfriend him, unfollow him on Instagram and Twitter and everywhere else, to prevent yourself from re-relapsing and fucking this guy again, you should block, unfriend, and unfollow him. Because someone who gets caught lying to you about having a degree that they don't actually have, and their pivot from that lie is, I'm doing top secret work for the government, that person is bananas. That person is not someone that you can trust with your heart or your parts or anything else. That's not someone you should be having unprotected sex with. That's not someone you should be in a relationship with. And you say you've caught him in lots of other little lies. Now, most relationships involve a little lying here and there. It actually is kind of a lubricant that greases the wheels of a relationship. But there are permissible, understandable, excusable, small lies. But when those permissible, perhaps understandable, even excusable small lies exist in a context with huge and inexplicable and confounding and inexcusable lies, yeah, all of that adds up to I'm dating a pathological liar, not somebody that I can trust And you don't want to be with somebody who the rest of your life, anything that comes out of their mouth, you're going to have to wonder whether you're being told the truth or not. Wonder if you're being played or not. So block the motherfucker already. B-T-M-F-A. Hi, uh, my name is Nicole and I'm a Magnum subscriber. And I just wanted to tell all the people out there who listen to the free micro edition that I did that obviously for quite some time. And then I started subscribing to the Magnum and it is definitely worth the money to have more Dan in your life. Uh, there's really just no better way to describe it than that. More Dan, more rants, more talk about the studies that some of the people who are into sex research do just basically more Dan and isn't Dan worth a couple extra bucks? I think so. Hi, this is a comment for the guy on episode 559, the college student who couldn't get laid. Dan, I think you've got it wrong. Um, And I feel so strongly I'm calling all the way from Australia to tell you this guy doesn't like women. He doesn't like women. He's not getting laid because they can tell he doesn't like them. All he sees them as is, is a potential receptacle for his penis. He's not relating to them. He's not connecting with them. He's not feeling any sort of kinship with them. He doesn't even see them as human beings. He sees them as potential fuck partners and they can tell which is why they're not interested. And what he needs to do is stop chasing women to get laid and maybe start getting to know women as human beings and making a couple of friends and maybe reading some feminist literature and go work in a women's shelter or something and just start seeing females as human beings and that might change his luck. Hi, Dan. I'm just calling in response to the caller who was really frustrated about not getting girls uh, to stay him in university. Uh, I just want to say that I'm a girl in university, and I just want him to know that it's okay. In one season, as in when the holiday season, I asked four people out, and they all turned me down. And it kind of sucked in the moment, I'm not going to lie, but I'm still friends with most of them today, uh, so it's okay. And I completely agree with Dan's advice. I think if you're looking to date someone, it's a lot easier to just ask them pretty soon in the relationship when you get to know them well enough to feel comfortable to do so. Um, It's just going to save your feelings later on. You won't feel as invested 
in the relationship. And if they turn you down and you're just, you don't want to be friends with them, it's a lot easier to move on as opposed to getting to know them, feeling comfortable around them, and then asking them out. But it's also, sometimes that just happens. Sometimes you just have really bad luck with girls or guys or whomever. So um, I don't want you to feel bad because it totally happened to me. I'm not mad at it. It's a thing that happened. Now it's kind of funny. So you'll have better luck another time. So good luck. Hey, Dan, this is in response to episode 559, the guy who sounded extremely sweet, uh, but having a difficult time connecting with women. You know, I'm a gay male, and I have the exact same challenge. I'm a good-looking guy. I have my act together, you know, all that good stuff. But I'll say this. A lot of the women that I deal with that are straight, they deal with so much shit from guys. So I think your advice as far as women are maybe guarded because men could be potentially violent or complete assholes, it's probably part of the challenge. And also, he sounded maybe potentially a little needy, and no one wants a needy guy, especially in a man. So sit back, relax. Maybe it's not your time to be in a relationship, you know? Then that's perfectly okay. Anyway, I deal with the same stuff. And we're going to leave it there. 206-302-2064 is the number here at the Savage Lovecast. If you'd like to record a question or a comment for a future show, give us a buzz. 206-302-2064. Follow me on Twitter at Fake Dan Savage. Follow Amanda Marcotte on Twitter at Amanda Marcotte. And be sure to read my column, Savage Love, every week in Now, in Toronto, and other papers all across North America and in Italy even. The Savage Love Cast is produced every week by Nancy Hartunian and me and the tech savvy at risk youth and Nancy. We'll all be back at you next week with another installment of the Savage Love Cast. Thanks for downloading.